Good afternoon. Welcome to the INSEAD Innovation Club. Uh, really excited uh, to have Susanna uh, joining our event, focusing on um, venture building. Uh, as you saw in the invitation, Susanna is the head of Telefonica Venture Builder, and she has an impressive background with 20 years uh, of her professional career spent in, on innovation. She was the head of Telefonica Venture Builder. She was the head of uh, Telef Telefonica Open Innovation Campus, taking care of entrepreneurship programs, uh, so-called Lean Elephants. And also she is the author of uh, HBR case study, Telefonica, a Lean Elephant, and two books, The Agile Company and The Lean Startup, application for uh, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. Susanna, thank you very much for accepting to, to join uh, this event. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, thank you very much also for joining uh, for joining the session. Well, uh, for those of you that don't know uh, Telefonica, uh, first allow me to start with a very, a very brief introduction of the, of the company. We are a telecom operator. Uh, we operate in 12 countries in Europe and uh, Latin America. We use different commercial brands depending on the country. Uh, you have them uh, you have them here but we have customers in 38 countries so we are present in all of those countries we are an almost 100 year old company actually our birthday is in april uh, we have more than uh, 100,000 employees and more than one uh, sorry 380 million customers but what I'm going to talk about today is uh, first I'm going to talk about our, our venture builder what is it and how we work uh, then I'm um, going to uh, talk about uh, why a venture builder inside or within a corporation, in which situations it, it might make sense. And finally, I'm going to share some, uh, some learnings that I hope are useful. Okay, starting uh, with, uh, with our venture builder, I'm going to talk about first our origins. And uh, uh, it was created at the beginning of uh, the year 2020. And at the beginning of that year, we already had out there um, uh, several investment vehicles. Uh, actually, these were the investment vehicles we had. We, you have it here. They are ordered according to the maturity of the startups invested and also according to the size of the investment ticket. And actually, we have been doing this for some years, right? Because uh, uh, Telefonica Ventures and Funds uh, are already out there, uh, were already out there since uh, 2006, and then Wire Halves uh, since 2011. So uh, Ventures and Funds are basically for strategic investments, and then uh, Wire Halves uh, for scaling startups. Uh, and this was like this until this week. Precisely this week, there has been a change and all these investment vehicles now are uh, united. There's only one investment vehicle that is our CVC and it's called Wire Ventures that invest in startups that, uh, that the, the size of the ticket could be between uh, 50,000 euros to 5 million euros, right? But when we were born at the beginning of 2020, uh, uh, this was what it looked like, right? So we had all these investment vehicles and we were we realized we were missing uh, we were missing a vehicle that would allow us not only to invest, but to create our own startups understood as independent companies uh, and basically uh, to have a spin-off vehicle, yeah, because we are a technological company. Um, so it was born and it was born, it was born as part, as part of the wire ecosystem uh, and it, initially it was named Wire Builder. Uh, last, year, last year, we changed it to Telefonica Venture Builder, and I'm going to explain and give you the reasons uh, for this uh, name changed a little bit later in a few minutes. Um, so what's our investment thesis? Uh, we invest up to 350,000 uh, euros in uh, full digital uh, business ideas. It could be B2B, B2C in the areas you can see here in the presentation. Um, and what's also very important is we get a maximum of 20% of the equity of the startups we create. Why 20%? Because we want our startups to, to uh, be able to uh, navigate and, and survive in the entrepreneurial world, in the venture capital world. And investors uh, don't like startups, especially in these early stages where the uh, founder team or management team don't have uh, the majority of the equity of the startup and, and the, a corporate has more than 20 or 25 percent of the equity of the startup. Uh, and what is it exactly what we offer? Um, 
uh, our team, the Venture Builder team, is a, is a small team. We're just six people, but it's a multidisciplinary team. We have a combination of different profiles, uh, business, finance, uh, product, uh, user experience design, and technological. And we offer what we call a 360 advice to the uh, founder team before the startup is being created, but also after the startup is being created. Um, uh, obviously, we have a, 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 our own CVC, so we can do follow-on investments through our CBC. We offer what we call perks uh, to our startups, that is uh, uh, access to our infrastructure and to our platforms, but also access to the infrastructure and platforms of our partners. Uh, uh, of course, connections, connections with our experts in the company that we have. You can imagine in a company of more than 100,000 uh, employees, uh, we have experts on almost every discipline uh, and of course uh, access or connections with our entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem other investors uh, founders and so on but what's also uh, very uh, relevant is that uh, we uh, are capable of helping our startups grow yeah because uh, it, when the startup matures and and if there's feet we can become the the, the customers and then, but also their products and services could become part of our portfolio and we can offer them to our customers as well. This is how we're working, don't worry. I'm not going to go <laughs> through through all of this. And, and basically, let's see, we can summarize it in, in something that looks like this. Um, it's not necessarily a linear process as, it, as it's shown here. So it's not necessarily in this order uh, how we do this, uh, how we do the, the 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 things. I mean, our process is not necessarily in this order, but basically we start, of course, by identifying a business idea and validating this business idea. And uh, if we decide it's worth moving forward, we take it to our investment committee. If we get a green light, then if the founder team is not already in place, because when the idea comes from the outside, usually the founder team is already there, uh, then we build the team. Um, uh, then we look for co-investors, and this is something that is critical for us. It's part of our validation process. Uh, if uh, there are no other investors interested in investing in the creation of the startup, it's probably because we are somehow biased and it's not a good idea. Uh, then we found the startup and during the next two years after the creation of the startup, we provide our uh, 360 advice to the founder team while they are uh, developing and, and launching the MVP in the market. Um, one of the things that we have realized in these years is that to find a winner, you have to discard a lot of ideas. You have to find an idea that you want to move forward. You have to discard a lot of them. Actually, in our case, it's between 80 to 100 ideas, right? Um, and uh, um, basically, this means that you need a constant deal flow of ideas and a very lean way of screening and validating uh, those ideas. So if we focus in particular in this first stage, um, uh, identifying and validating the ideas, um, from the very beginning, we realized that having only an internal source of ideas wasn't going to be it wasn't going to be enough. So we are open also for for external ideas that could come from all the venture builders, uh, other corporates, um, from uh, academia, our own website. Yeah, if you go to our website, you you can see there that people can submit the their ideas, and yeah, why not word of mouth as well. So when we get uh, an idea, what we do first is what we call idea screening. Basically, what we do first is uh, validate if it complies with our investment thesis. If it does, then we check if uh, it's addressing a real and painful problem and our evidence is there that this is, uh, this is a real and painful problem for, for customers. Um, then we check if it's a differential and innovative proposal. And if uh, it uh, complies with these three things, we move it to the next phase that it's uh, the idea validation phase. So in the idea validation phase, taking advantage that we are a multidisciplinary team, we uh, do our what we call a 360 assessment of both the idea and the team in case the idea comes with the with the team. Uh, if we decide it's worth moving forward, we turn this 360 uh, assessment into a 360 advice and uh, work on improving the idea and preparing it and uh, to take it to our investment committee. 
and if our investment committee gives us the green light to go ahead then uh, we we move with the next uh, with the next steps uh, one example of uh, one of the startups that we have created is uh, shadow uh, well shadow is uh, is basically a cybersecurity uh, a startup that uh, protects business documents. Um, it prevents uh, your employees or third parties leaking uh, your company's confidential documents uh, by protecting them with invisible watermarks. Yeah, um, the solution is based uh, on a patented technology that what does is uh, links documents to individuals and legal entities uh, in a non-visible way. Um, and allows you to have full traceability of the documentation, even in a physical environment. Well, um, Shadow uh, or the technology that Shadow has initially was a technology that we had in Telefonica that was uh, like sitting on a shelf waiting to be used. And uh, we identified it as an opportunity to spin off. And now Shadow, I like also this example, not, not only because it's a spin off, and, uh, but also because now it's something we offer our business customers and it's uh, complementing our portfolio offer yeah when we go to when we go to our customers with our uh, cybersecurity solutions uh now let's move to the to the next section yeah um why why is it uh, why does it make sense or in which situation does it make sense to have a venture builder inside uh, the the, the company and actually this is a question that we asked uh, these are questions that we ask ourselves at the beginning of uh, 2023 because if you think about it there are already a lot of corporate venture builders out there yeah there are, there are more and more corporate venture builders out there that can uh, somehow help you or even do the venture building for you yeah it's not necessary really to have a, a, an internal team doing venture building yeah so after asking our questions, the, uh, uh, these questions to ourselves, we we did last year three major changes. Um, one of these uh, major changes was uh, moving from being reactive to proactive. That means basically that uh, uh, instead of waiting for ideas to come, uh, we also come up with our own business ideas. Uh, and this uh, came uh, from a conversation I had with the CEOs of um, other venture builders. And, and basically they told me, hey, you have access to customers, partners, and providers. Why don't you take advantage of this uh, to identify uh, problems while solving and come up with the, with the, with solutions and 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 hence, um, business ideas for potential startups yourself? And this is something that uh, we are also doing uh, right now. Yeah, we 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 get ideas, but we also come up with our own business ideas. And actually, on, on Tuesday next week, we we are taking to an investment committee uh, one of these ideas we we came up with. Um, uh, and collaborating and partnering with uh, with another virtual builder. The good thing about coming up with uh, with your own business ideas uh, also is that uh, you can look internally in the company closely to the assets that you have and uh, identify those assets that can somehow be transferred to uh, to these uh, the, the startups you want to create or, and. Uh, make those assets uh, become a differential and sustainable competitive advantage for the startup that this is something that we have realized is uh, is after absolutely key when you're doing venture building so uh, another important thing that we have done another important change that we have done is uh, becoming a, an external incubation vehicle for the company um, at the beginning of 2023 in february in february last year in particular uh, Telefonica created a new area uh, called Discovery, uh, where all the early stage innovation initiatives are located now, including ourselves, the, the venture builder. Um, so we are not any longer with the, the, the investment vehicles uh, of, tele, of Telefonica. And basically, um, becoming uh, the, the excavation vehicle of this area, Discovery, um, allows us that when we want to explore a particular opportunity space that we have identified and considering things like uh, the company's strategy, the capabilities, resources, technologies, IPs we have, and even things like the window of opportunity, we can decide which one is the right vehicle for approaching or addressing that particular innovation opportunity. 
um, is it something that makes sense to incubate and 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 carry out through our internal innovation teams, or is it really something that makes sense to excavate through our venture builder? And uh, the magic of this uh, model is that by having these two vehicles together in, in, in this early stage innovation organization is that it gives you the flexibility and the autonomy to change from one vehicle to another. So uh, let's say you start by addressing uh, an opportunity uh, uh, by incubating it because you think it's the right way to proceed. But uh, then after uh, progressing with it, you realize that uh, it doesn't make any sense any longer to incubate, but to excavate it, you, you can do it and, and vice versa, right? Uh, also, another important thing is that uh, um, having uh, or becoming our builder or excavation vehicle allows us to enhance the value of the company's assets um, in case incubation is not the best way to proceed uh, and it's not the best option to proceed anymore. So uh, instead of having um, this or leaving these technologies, ideas uh, on a shelf when you decide you, you are not going to incubate it or you're not going to continue incubating them. Uh, you can explore the uh, opportunity of doing a spin-off and, and explore them uh, externally, like in the case of, uh, of Shadow. And also, it gives you the opportunity to explore uh, partnerships with uh, other venture builders, uh, other uh, investors or corporates from other industries where both parties uh, put uh, complementary assets to create differential and sustainable competitive advantages for the startups that we might create together uh, to explore uh, a potential opportunity that you have identified. And the third one, I already mentioned it, yeah, that it's basically changing changing the name. Precisely because we wanted to focus more on enhancing the assets that we have in, in Telefonica is why on November last year, we decided to change our name from uh, Wira Builder to Telefonica Venture Builder. So uh, going back yeah, to the, the questions I was uh, talking about at the beginning yeah, uh, of, of this section, um, we basically, um, the main reasons, and in particular, the four main reasons for us uh, to decide that uh, we, it makes sense to have a venture builder and in which situations it makes sense uh, for us to have a venture builder are, are these four. The first one is, um, if you want to create competitive advantages by leveraging the company's assets, you need to understand and know very well uh, those assets and have access to them. That's absolutely key. And this is something that basically an internal team uh, can do. An external team is very difficult uh, for this to, to, to happen. Also, um, most of nowadays uh, corporate venture builders aren't specialized or verticalized. Uh, so if your aim is like in our case to create uh, uh, digital technological companies uh, that could potentially become you, you, you could potentially become their customers in the future or they could become your partners somehow, it's very important to understand very well your industry. Yep. And uh, also there is the the flexibility and the the autonomy. Yeah, I mentioned that uh, that to, having two vehicles gives you yeah because. What happens if we decide that uh, we don't want to continue excavating something because maybe it becomes something strategic? Yeah, there's a change in the strategy of the company and and, and working that it doesn't make any sense to to do any excavation, but to bring it inside the company and create it. So it might be uh, kind of difficult depending on on how you are doing that that excavation unless it's part of uh, like your your day to day or or your way of working. Yeah. And finally, um, this is possible because in our case, we have the capabilities and the skills to ideate, validate and create a startups. And, and uh, yeah, this is something that we can do because we have this, yeah. So that's also something that it's critical if you want to um, do something like this, venture building inside the, the, the company. And uh, finally, uh, I'm going to share some lessons learned and I'm going to start with uh, what let's call general lessons learned that in reality, 
I think they could be applied to to any innovation initiative you launched in a corporation. And the first one is um, alignment. You have to be aligned with the company's strategy and priorities and, and ensure you are addressing the fundamental needs of the company. Because if you don't do that, what you're doing is innovation theater and nobody's going to care about the, the results you're bringing. Second is you have to ensure you are creating value for the company and you are measuring the value you are creating for the for the company. And then finally, um, when you launch open innovation initiatives, um, you are enhancing a cultural shift and process transformation in the in the company. So you you have to learn how to work with third parties, yeah, with the startups, with investors, uh, with um, why not academic institutions, uh, uh, founders, and so on. And and this means that you have to adapt the processes that you have in the company and and be more flexible, yeah, to be able to work with them. And uh, yeah, now let's move to the um, particular uh, learnings regarding venture building. So the first one is you you need to have a very clear investment thesis uh, because this sets uh, both the objectives of your venture builder, but also sets the rules of the games for everyone. So basically for, uh, for your investment committee, for all your investors, for founders, and so, et cetera. The second one is, uh, of course, market validations are key, but the team is also absolutely key. The chances of success are higher with a good team with a bad idea than a bad team with a good idea. Um, and corporations, we are not just investors. Yeah, uh, We have certain assets that can help our startups grow and can also bring um, uh, competitive advantages to the startups you are creating. Um, you will have to make uh, a lot of decisions during this process, and you're never going to have 100% certainty, so you will have to take uh, risks. But something we have learned that is absolutely key is that uh, uh, you have to ensure that before you create a startup, you have a uh, a sustainable competitive advantage of if you if you prefer an unfair advantage yeah otherwise if your startup is successful and there are no entry barriers um in a very short time you're going to have a lot of competitors several competitors and being the first one in the market is not an advantage any longer and this is what i wanted to share uh, just to uh, i don't know <laughs> somehow uh, create some potential questions and, and discussions. So uh, we can have that. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see everyone. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Susanna. Um, maybe you can leave that slide uh, a bit longer there. Okay, okay, people. sorry. Uh, of course, sorry. they have in the invite, they have your name and uh, yes, and find you on LinkedIn, but- uh, Yeah, okay. Uh, let me see. Based on our previous discussion, uh, but also in line with the objectives of, of our club, uh, basically we want not just to learn, but also to connect and learn from each other. And uh, yeah, especially in innovation, uh, even from different disciplines, uh, mm -hmm. different companies uh, can come uh, great ideas and feasible and desirable, let's say, uh, opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, excellent. So let's... Uh, Quickly go uh, through the chat and uh, see uh, what questions we have so far. Okay. We have a question from uh, Ramsey. Uh, how would you judge the success uh, of the ideas that went through the venture builder versus those that were invested directly uh, through your CVC? Well, that's a difficult question, but but also, I mean, we don't create a startups. Um, I mean, the aim of creating a startup uh, is not to compete with the startups we invest in. So actually what we do is, uh, if we create a startup, is because there are not already any startups out there that are addressing an opportunity we have identified, or they are not addressing it in the way that we think is the, is the right one to address it, right? So it's basically we are not trying to compete with the investment part. Actually, it's like uh, uh, the second step in case 
that in case of that investing in an existing startup uh, is not a viable way uh, for us to address uh, an opportunity. So we are not trying to compete with it. Uh, this is like a, um, a plan B, yeah, in case there are not a, there are not a startups out there we can invest in. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, I would like to invite the participants to to ask the questions uh, orally themselves to make it uh, mm -hmm. a bit more uh, human. Yeah, so, I uh, think I, I can stop yeah. sharing the screen so I can yeah. see. <laughs> exactly, see the reactions as well. Yeah. Um, especially for those people uh, who have the camera on. If you could leave your camera on, it's uh, nicer. But of course, if you're driving or if you're doing something else, uh, uh, it's okay to leave it off. So let's see, uh, John, do you want to ask your question directly to Susanna? Yeah, thank you for the presentation, Susanna. It's it's nice, not only how you've done it, but how structured that you can communicate it. it it's it's very impressive. I, I, can, I can see how that translates into a book or out of a book in, in the process. So thank you for that. Um, specific two questions I had. One was... Um, the investment committee seems like has quite a bit of power. So, so what's the success criteria that they are under? I mean, how do you measure if they are doing a right job? And then more generally, can you give a, an illustration of an incubated and an excubated company that have come out of it? So, so to illustrate it. Okay, so the investment committee is basically a wireless investment committee. So, and I think it's something tricky and we had to learn how to actually that is why for example the investment thesis and having it very clear is uh, is very important because it sets the the rules and um uh, basically what is i i would dare say what is more difficult is basically we are competing with the startups that are already customers right that is like the startups they are investing in so it's not uh, it's not easy and one of the things that basically we have learned is like uh, we have to do some sort of lobbying with the members of the investment committee, yeah. And uh, actually, another thing of the another other thing of the things we have learned is somehow we have to uh, involve them in the validation process so they can they can give us feedback. And with that feedback, we can we can evolve. And actually, in many cases, what happens is that uh, we have become to know them very well. Uh, in the sense that maybe in some situations it's ourselves who discard things according to the feedback we get and according to what we have uh, what we have uh, been taking to the to the um, to the investment committee uh, and basically they have discarded and the reasons they have discarded because honestly it's a lot of work this screening of ideas validating the ideas preparing the ideas for taking it to the investment committee. And this is uh, this is one of the things that uh, that uh, that we have learned. And yes, they have all the power because basically they have they are the ones that give you the green light. Because basically, when we create a startup, it, it, we are also investing in the startup. So if the investment committee says no and we don't have the investment money, basically you cannot do you cannot do anything. So yeah, they they have all the power, honestly. So yeah, yeah. So that's why we have learned to involve them as soon as possible that when there is an idea that we think and uh, that, that we think uh, we think we, we want to move forward and and take it to to the end basically um and the success ratio uh, uh, it, it, i guess it has improved uh, it, it it has improved but we don't have like um, like um, um, 100% certainty that when we take something to the investment committee, it's going to go through. Because also, as I as I mentioned, we are competing for the investment uh, for the investment budget. So depending on the situation, sometimes it's you take a great idea, but because of the situation of uh, the budget for investment uh, is maybe at the end of the year and there's not many money left. Uh, you can be rejected. So yeah, it's not it's not easy. And there was another question. Sorry, I don't remember. Oh, I cannot hear you. I'm oh, sorry. Whether you had an example of an incubator that has worked well or where you took the external and it has gone well. Okay. So we something we started incubating. Well, of course, there is a shadow. Well, that is one example. We have another example that it's uh, Dither. Dither is basically a, um, a technology that automates uh, um, 
the customer relationship. Uh, it's also B two B, but automates customer relationship for for businesses. Those are uh, those were initially technologies that were incubated internally, but we decided to mm, not continue doing it internally, and then we excavate them. Um, um, but also we have examples of uh, things that we have been incubated, incubating, and then we uh, start analyzing if it makes sense to create a startup, and we realize that no. And the reasons this happens a lot of time, yeah, because I mean, not everything you have on a shelf, uh, it's something that you can turn into a startup, yeah. Uh, uh, reasons uh, mainly, I would dare say there are two reasons. The first one is uh, in many cases, things that you are, you are incubated uh, are too related to the core. And in particular, too related to uh, core assets like uh, your data or your uh, our infrastructure and so on. And you cannot have a startup as an independent company that really has to rely a lot of, uh, on, on your core. And the second main reason is uh, basically because, uh, yeah, in many cases, these uh, products or services or technologies have been discarded because um, um, there wasn't business. And if there is no business for Telefonica, uh, not necessarily is going to be business for a startup, right? So uh, I would dare say that, that, that there's no business opportunity. So many of them are being discarded because when we analyze it, um, there's no, no, no business opportunity there. So those are the main reasons. And uh, I would dare say that the, the case of Dieter and Shadow is like the exception. In many of the cases we have analyzed things that we have in, in there, don't make it uh, as a startup. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Yeah, clear. Yeah, thank you. Um, going through the chat a bit, uh, maybe um, Jake Casely, uh, would you like to address your question? Hi, how are you? Sorry, I had to drop in and out. Some technical difficulty. Um, right. but, um, so I'm in a, an, an incubation unit myself, and I think the one thing that we um, we spend a lot of time doing is turning no's into yeses. So I think. Um, I would love to hear from your perspective as to kind of how you tackle that challenge. I think um, one of my colleagues describes it as a, um, a high rise building and you get in at the first floor and it's no, then you get to the second floor, then you get to the second floor. How do you kind of smash through those floors and then get to the ultimate yeses? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, one thing obviously that um, I think there is also a question of credibility there. Um, that plays a very important role. Um, and credibility basically goes with, uh, for example, we don't take, um, we don't go for a yes when something is very uh, immature, because if you don't have like a strong evidences, you're going to get a no. And um, something that we have also learned is that uh, that goes against your credibility as a team. And when uh, we come with the nose directly ourselves and say, hey, we have been analyzing this, but we have realized that uh, uh, doing some validations, some tests in the market, this doesn't go ahead. And, and you are being kind of like transparent and honest. And when you take something is with evidences, with clear evidences that that is a that that is something that is worth that is worth it, that there is a potential business there and so on, you little by little are gaining credibility. And in um, and it, basically, in my experience, that is what the, in the end turns and uh, knows into yes. But I, I would dare say is that clear evidence is because I don't know in, in your case, but in, in our case, we have and well, this is being recorded, but I hope it doesn't get to our executives. Yeah, but we have a lot of executives in the company that says no, because I know what my customers want. And unless you come with clear evidences from customers saying yes this is something i want it's very 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 difficult to change their to change their mind so i would dare say it's it's critical to bring uh, uh, evidences uh, uh, from the market clear evidences and and some sort of maturity and ideas to get those uh, to get those yes and to get those yeses and did i answer your question yeah absolutely i think it's always good to get another perspective on it yeah 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 but, but actually, it's a very good question as well. Yeah, maybe, uh, Joe, would you mind uh, uh, detailing a bit uh, what kind of venture builder uh, are you in? Which sector, yeah. at least? Or... 
Um, I am in a um, actually a, a collegial um, venture building to um, to Suzanne. So I'm in Liberty Global's incubation okay. unit. So I okay. know that we have it with Wayra through our VMO too. Okay. Okay. Oh, good. Let's go. So maybe I'll um, grab some time for a coffee with you after the call. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. It would be great to share some experiences. Sure. All right. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Nathan as well. Yeah, my, my question's about like the idea pipeline. Mm -hmm. I've had experience in like large financial institutions trying to come up with ideas. The majority of them are not good ideas. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is twofold. Where do the majority of your ideas come from? And then uh, which types of ideas are actually the ones that seem to get through your pipeline the most? Okay. Um, so most of the ideas come externally uh, from our website, other venture builders, other corporations that approach us and say, hey, uh, we would like uh, to create a startup and, and, and we want you to be part of this creation of the startup. So most of the ideas uh, come, come externally. Um, but well, of course, there are some ideas that come uh, that come internally. And um, uh, sorry, there was another question: is uh, where most of the ideas come from? And yeah, so and then which sources of ideas? So based on the variety of sources, which ones actually prove the most like successful? Uh, yeah. So uh, actually, the most successful ones are, uh, or at least the most interesting ones that at least make it to the validation and these these assessment part and so on are the ones coming from other venture builders or from other corporations because they have gone through some validation process and uh, in some cases but not always the internal ones if they have gone to through some validations because we get a lot of uh, internal ideas that are solutions in search of a problem to to solve right <laughs> a customer problem to solve and those ones Wow, <laughs> are really, really complicated. But the ones coming from other venture builders or other corporations are usually the, the ones that are closer to something we look more carefully to because they have gone through um, through a validation process. So they, they already have this market evidences and so on I was I was mentioning um, uh, in, in the previous question. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So we have a hand raised from Rahima as well. Hi guys. Um, so I have a question for you. What would you, if you were to set this up again, you mentioned the, ex uh, the, the excubation, did it happen two years ago? No, it, it, it becoming it an excubation vehicle um, and being part of uh, yeah. the same organization as the, the incubation teams uh, happened last year, actually in February okay. last year. So I'm just curious um, if you were given a magic wand um, and you had the authority and the budget to set up, reset this up again, given the challenges that you've experienced in the last year, what would you change? What would you do diff differently? Wow, there are so many things I would do different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it would it would have been great to have like a crystal ball. Yeah, there are many many things that uh, I would have done different. Um, uh first um i wouldn't uh the first one is this focus on on the assets that we have in the company yeah because in reality there was a certain moment and this happened um this happened not exactly in 2023 but on on 2022 we realized we were somehow competing uh with the uh, venture builders out there uh for ideas and in reality, that didn't make any sense. Yeah, why were we competing like if we were just a regular venture builder out there? It didn't make any sense. We were part of a corporation. And uh, and that is why there was a certain moment, like an inflection point that we said, hey, let's rethink. Let's rethink the, the builder. And, and that's when also uh, in 2023 happened that really we became closer much closer to to uh, to what's Telefonica and because basically that's what it, it gives us like our value proposition yeah we are not just any venture builder but competing for ideas founders and so on like a regular co uh, venture builder it doesn't make any sense right also uh, when we started we 
didn't do any real market validation before the creation of the startup. Before the creation of the startup, um, we were just doing like some sort of business case. Uh, because the team, I, I I wasn't exactly there when when the when the when the venture builder was created, but when the venture venture builder was created, there were just two people and two people with the same profiles as the rest of the investment uh, vehicles, right? They were people by business and finance. So basically, uh, what the, the what the, it was being done by them is a business case. And if the business case looked good, uh, then uh, the startup was being created. Uh, and it was the founder team that had to do these market validations, pivoting, and and so on until the, there was an MVP that was launched in the market. What happens there is basically you run out of money before you achieve the product market fit, right? Uh, because there's so much pivoting because something you put in a business case has so little chances of becoming a reality, even with market validations. And you, we, we still do this this business case once we have some market validations and, 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 and so on. But in reality, we, we, we know that the chances that that business case is going to become a reality is, are very low. But if you haven't done any market validations, are even lower. Yeah. So uh, th these are things because at the beginning, it, it wasn't a multidisciplinary team, right? And also, I think that is key. Yeah, to have different profiles uh, so you can view the ideas from the different perspectives that you have even technical people, but technical people for two reasons. Um, the first one is because uh, you can um, do some prototyping and, and 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 something that you can test with customers. But it doesn't have to be like the final solution. But you can build something that the customers can can work with. So you you gather even more bar market validations to ensure that it makes sense. Um, uh, because it's not just the, the the investment money you put there, but you you can imagine. Uh, how much time and effort it takes to create the startup in, in the legal, legal sense and in, in looking for the founder team. It takes a lot of time and resources. So you have to be a, a, as, as sure as possible that it's something that is going to that is going to make sense. But also uh, something that it's, uh, we have discovered that is absolutely key is these, um, these advice that we give the team once the startup is being created. It's absolutely key. Uh, because um, the, the, the first two years of the startup are the most difficult ones and they need all the help they can get. We have had situations in, in which uh, uh, we have also helped other startups from, from, from wide eye investments where they were having problems because they were dying of success because the, the architecture, the technical architecture they had when they started having a lot of customers, the costs of the technology were growing exponentially. So the team was running out of money because of the exponential cost of having more customers. And we we gave them advice on how to change the technical architecture. Yeah, so so basically these are these are things that uh, that I would do different now that uh, now that uh, it has changed. Also things that uh, the, the type of founder team you look for, yeah. Uh, also, uh, and now we have some some clues of, of, of which type of things work, yeah. And not only in in the sense of the profile of the people, but also um, a founder team uh, has to be like a, a family, yeah. In the sense that they are going to share, that they are going to go through rough times, right? And and we have had situations in which people have met in I don't know in a hackathon a weekend, and they say, hey, we got on very well, and uh, we're going to create a startup together. But when rough times comes, if those are are people that haven't worked together in the past, and they they really know how to work together, you're going to have problems. And to be honest. Um, the reason why many of the startups don't work out is not because of the of the business opportunity or so on, but because of the team. So yeah, uh, we would do that also different. And I could, I think, I could talk of a lot of things that we would uh, we would do different. But if I have to pick like the most relevant ones, I would dare say that those were definitely the things I would uh, I would uh, I would change yeah uh, closer to to the company uh, have a value position clear based on that you're a venture builder in the in the company and uh, yeah and how how do, how we do things right okay great <laughs> nice to see uh, in retrospective and uh easy when you look back right but uh, of course yeah 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 you look ahead you never know yeah 
Yeah. But that's one thing about innovation, right? We deal with lots, a lot of uh, unknowns. It's just uh, how we minimize, let's say, the risk. Yeah, but also I think as as um, innovators, we also have um, it's part of our role uh, testing ways of doing innovation. Yeah, testing them and and learning and pivoting in the way we do in we in the ways we do things, right? And and sometimes we are even like kind of uh, pioneers inside the corporation in in testing certain things of way of doing things and and the ones that work exporting them. To the to the rest of the organization and uh, yeah exactly. it can be frustrating but also i think it's uh uh it's it's something very enjoyable at least for me it is right uh we also have a question from uh guy louis yes um hi susanna hi everyone hi. um i um, i have a question about because i, I was part of a corporate startup studio um uh, for the last four years and um, they had a particular measure to a um, particular way to measure success and i wanted to, to quickly ask how do you measure success it's it's kind of a easy question but in in, in our case um, they were still a bit old style and looking at the EBIT of the company and how much would that consolidate in the mother company and so how much would that uh, help with the profitability um, so were you able in your case to kind of shift the mentality to go into equity value um and 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 so is that how you measure success uh, with the companies that that you create or how do you go about it so this is also that has been evolving yeah because at the beginning the the main or the, the main purpose uh, was basically a return on investment obviously not short term because if you launch a startup then it's going to take years until you you have some potential return on investment due to the equity you you have in the company so it was as it was born as part of the investment vehicles obviously the 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 measure of success uh, was was closer to closer to that and uh, it is something that is changing and has been changing um so now also uh one of the things that we have we have seen as we have gone closer to what's telefonica and and what's uh, what's the assets and and enhancing the the assets that we have in a company uh now we have kpis in the sense of um for example uh which uh, or, or do we have for example technologies that we have in the company that somehow we are being able to transfer to the uh, startups uh, we create so somehow we are uh, creating value or or enhancing the value of the things that we have created it's not necessarily something that we are not using in the company but for example we have technologies that we can somehow uh, license to the startups it's not that we are not using them as well but we can also license them so it's like uh, getting another way of creating value with the assets that we have in the company so we have kpis like uh, like those ones right now we also have now uh, kpis uh, like uh, helping uh, other teams other uh, other incubation teams also to come up with uh, with business ideas from the technologies and the products and services that they are building so we are kind of like the business arm of the discovery area so also we have kpis in the sense of helping bringing the business to the to these technologies products and services that we are working that our teams are working on and identifying potential uh potential technologies and and that could become products and services of the company so it's our objectives are not any longer creating startups so actually if we if we help create a product and service that becomes part of the portfolio of Telefonica it's also uh, a win for us uh, so I, I would dare say that, that now success looks something completely different from what it looked at the beginning and that is why at the beginning we were like any regular venture builder right uh, and th that has changed and now we have KPIs uh, um, that are around these type of things yeah and, and we are measured at the end of the year actually the last time I had a conversation with uh, with our chief innovation officer, he said, I don't care if you don't create a startups, 
in one year, as long as you have helped creating also products and services. So uh, creating startups is not our aim now. And I think that uh, that this precisely makes easier this part of uh, making an honest decision. When you have something, uh, an opportunity you want to address, which is the proper way to proceed? Otherwise, I would be competing with my, <laughs> with the other innovation teams uh, in senses of, no, 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 this is an opportunity we should excavate, right? Uh, we should create a startup here because you are competing for the opportunities in, in some sense. And I think this change uh, in the KPIs has somehow um, helped this collaboration and, and having like uh, these uh, two vehicles and making honest decisions in which one is the way to proceed. Great. Did I, did I answer? Yeah, your question? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I, I think it's super interesting to go beyond the the, the purely financial uh, KPIs and, yeah. and, and go into uh, helping the internal teams also. Yeah, thanks for your perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, that was one of my questions as well. Like, you measure purely impact on revenues, or but I've seen in your slides you put a lot of emphasis on competitive advantage and yeah, the, helping the company overall. Yeah. Well, I think we have time for a last question. Uh, I see Alberto with the hand raised. Uh, you're on mute, so if you'd like to unmute first. Yeah, yeah. thanks so much for the presentation. Uh, I was just wondering, I think one of the things that you bring to the table to these startups is not the 250K or whatever amount you may put in, uh, but it's really the scale that you can bring, uh, at least in, in theory and in potential, uh, yeah. through multi-star vivo O2 uh, operating companies. So uh, how do you, I mean, obviously, if I were a startup entrepreneur, I'm coming to you, I'm not, I can probably get 250 somewhere, but I cannot get, I don't know how many tens of millions of potential customers out there. So how do you value that in those discussions vis-a-vis uh, -vis the external investor that you want to accompany that, that, that deal? Yeah, actually, I, I, it's part of a value proposition, right? It's uh, why would, uh, I don't know, a founder or a founder team would, would like to be um, um, the founder of one of our, of our um, startups. That is one of the main assets we, we can bring to the table. But being said that is not something easy. And it took us in general uh, years and, and years, not only for the venture builder, but in general for our investment vehicles for this to happen, right? Because you have to change the culture in the company because uh, the, the, those customers are not in the innovation organization or in the investment organization or whatever are in the business units and are the business units that can give you access to those uh, to those customers right so uh, this is something that since uh, this these vehicles the investment vehicles were launched uh, has to be changed the culture in the company so people are open to include these startups as part of their as part of their portfolio uh, and offering for the customers and uh, and uh, I think that is one of the biggest success in general with all the open innovation initiatives in, in Telefonica, uh, being able or paving the way for this happening. And this is something that took years, it took years in many sense, not only for the business units to be open to collaborate to, with the startups and, and reach these uh, revenue share agreements. So you, they give them access to the customers and so on. But uh, also in things like, for example, the purchase department, I mean, uh, the purchase department cannot treat a startup the same way as they treat, I don't know, Ericsson or these other big companies because you might kill the startup, yeah, right? Uh, so uh, changing the way, and actually there's there's a different process and there are different conditions for uh, companies that are considered as startups compared to uh, the rest of the providers. And this took this took a lot of time and a lot of meetings and so on from uh, from this. Um, I mean, the the, the wire team in general, to make this happen in the to make this happen in the company. But also something you have to understand is, I mean, uh, the, the the customers expect a certain level of maturity of the solutions that they are going to use. So obviously, we are never the first customer of a startup. Never. It has to be somehow the the the, the product or the services has to be mature enough for our customers uh, to be used. That doesn't mean that it has to be super mature. It, it had to become like a, a startup uh, of uh, 10 years or something like that. No, no, no. But at least it has to have some other customers. Uh, it has to have, um, of course, some um, um, 
um, sorry, um, operations, maintenance, and and customer support services, and so on in place. Yeah, so we we are never going to be the first customers, or our customers are never going to be the first customers of a startup. And you have to understand that, and 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 play with that. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks so much. Huh? You're welcome. Okay, so um, I think uh, probably we still have uh, tens of questions, but. Uh... The hour passed, so uh, in the interest of time, we can stop here unless there are some really burning questions in the audience. Um, but uh, otherwise, I uh, really thank you, Susanna. It was an excellent uh, session for me personally, and I hope for the participants as well. And also, I would like to encourage everybody to connect, uh, get in touch. I think most of us are in the innovation space, so collaboration and learning is uh, really important and um, if you have any uh, suggestions for future events don't hesitate to reach out and um, uh, submit your your ideas we're always open for uh, new type of formats or different topics for our innovation events but again i'd like to thank you and uh, let's stay in touch Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. It was um, it was great meeting you all. So and yes, please let's connect. You can see I love talking about this, so we can we can connect and share more experiences. So thank you very much for having me here.